So our verse for today is the book of Matthew 14, verse 22. You guys know this. You guys know this is one of the most popular miracles that God did. Water, uh, changing water into wine, turning water into wine. There's raising Lazarus from the dead. And then everyone knows this miracle. It's when Jesus walked on water. And if we read Matthew 14, verse 22, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Is there anybody here today that's been buffeted by the waves recently? That's been going, that, that's been hitting, getting hit by the waves and getting hit by the storm in their life right now? In verse 25, it says, Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them. In the darkest hour of their lives, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake, walking on the storm, walking on the very thing that is, that is, that, that, that is, that walking on the very thing that is struggling, that, that, that they're struggling in. That's what Jesus is doing. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified and they said, it's a ghost, they said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, he didn't rebuke them, he didn't say, do you not know who I am? He said, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And what Peter says here is amazing. Lord, if it is you. In some, in some, in some translation it says, Lord, because it is you, tell me. Since it's you, Lord, tell me to come to you on the water. So Jesus said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. And on verse 31, he said, immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. And he said, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. And they had crossed over the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent the word to all surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who touched him were healed. Thank you, Lord, for your word today, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, Lord God, that the miracles that uh, the, the mir your miracles, Lord God, are not only just displayed, Father, in the, in the biblical times, Lord Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we get to experience your miracles in this very age, Lord Jesus. That we, not, we do not just get to read about your miracles. That we, we do not just get to read about your move, Lord God. But we are experiencing your move right now, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for your word, Lord God. I believe, Lord God, that this is a word that is in season. I believe, Lord God, that this is a word, Lord God, for every single person here. They may be going through a big storm, a small storm, or they may not be going through a storm at all, Father. But I know, Lord Jesus, that your word, Lord God, is right on time, Lord Jesus. Your word will speak to them, Lord God, in the hearts of your people today, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord God, that you would open up the hearts, that you would open up their hearts, you would open up their minds, Lord God, to understand, Lord God, what you have to say tonight, Lord God. Lord, it is, not, it is not my words, Lord Jesus. I am preaching, Lord God, from your words, Lord God, from you, you who is my source in Jesus' name. Lord, my words, Lord God, will, won't have any impact to these people, Father. But I know, Lord God, that your words will. Thank you, Lord Father, for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, JC. Red Honda Fit QDL353. Can you please move your car? You're blocking the garage. Uh, red Honda Fit QDL353, blocking the garage. Please move your car. Okay, I think someone's moving already. <laughs> Why does this always happen? Okay, so the title of, my, uh, of God's message today is, Where Are You Looking? Where are you looking? Um, for the youth here and the, um, actually, if, you're, uh, if you have a mother, you would, you would relate to this. You would relate to this, that. 
For some reason, mothers are so good at looking for things, right? They're so good at finding things. Sometimes. For, oh, I don't know about your mom, but my mom is the best at looking for things. My mom finds things like that. You know, I'd be like, I'd be like, Sometimes I'd, I'd spend so long uh, looking for my keys, looking for a hat, looking for a piece of clothing. I'd be like, I'd be like, I know, but uh, where is this? Where is this? And I'd get so frustrated because I would look and I would look everywhere in my room. I would look everywhere in my room, and then, and then mom would just go into my room. Five seconds later, and he said, "I you know." And then she would always say this word. She would always say, mm, "Mata, mata, mata, mata." Which means, which means, uh, if you don't know Tagalog, it means eyes. Use your eyes, Mako. Use your eyes. Mata, mata, kung sang sa tumitingin. Like, that's what she says. In Tagalog, look. Kung sang sa tumitingin. Where, where you're looking. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's how I pronounce it. But mom always says that. Uh, I know if Ia was here, she, 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 would, um, she would vouch for that. Mata, 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 mata. Where are you looking? That's the title of my message for today. Where are you looking? And, you know... When you when you drive when I'm driving as well when I'm driving as well and then sometimes I I get distracted by by uh, the out uh, the sides of the road or some sort of scenery I'm like wow look at that and then I would swerve just a little bit and mom would be like mm 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 san san kasi tumitingin eh where are you looking where are you looking Marco you know I I read somewhere that where oh um there's there's this um driving instructor instructor that said that if wherever you look that's where you will go. So if you look to your, if, if you're distracted and you keep looking to your right, what's, what, what tends to happen is you tend to swerve to your right. Where, wherever you look, that's where you will go. And, 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 and storms, church, in storms, church, when, when, when we go through a storm, often what happens is we look at other things other than Jesus. We look, we look at the surroundings. We look at, we look at so many things that we keep our eyes of Jesus, and that is the reason why we struggle in storms, why we sink in storms, why we, why we are, you know, why we, why we don't do well, why we don't cope, why we're discouraged in storms, because we, we tend to look at the waves, we tend to look at uh, the shore that is far from us, we tend to look at all the other things, and we don't look at Jesus. So today, church, we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at, we're gonna take a look at where we should look at, rather than looking at the storm that we are facing, because. What I was going to do is I was going to give you three points on, things, on three things that we did look at. But instead of doing that, I don't want us to focus on that. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about three things on what we should look at rather than the storm, rather than the, than the things that we regularly look at. So the first point that I have today is focus on the will of God and not the destination. Recognize me. Hang on, sorry. Okay. Okay, Holy Spirit, come back. Church, when we go through a storm, we just want it to be over straight away, right? Nobody really likes going through storms and trials. Have you ever met a person who loves going through storms? Have you ever met a person who loves going through through tribulations, trials and tribulations? Have you ever met someone who's like, ah, man, yes, a storm's coming up. My favorite part of the year when, when I'm broke. My favorite part of the year when, when I, I don't have food on my table. I, I, my favorite part is coming up. A storm is coming up. I, I'm sick again. Yes, I'm sick again. There's, you know, it's been too easy for a while. I, I, need, I need a storm in my life. Have you ever met a person like that? No. There's not a single person in this world that would rather be in a storm than under sunshine. When we go through a tough season in life, we, we always pray and wish for it to be over straight away, right? We tend to look at the other side of the storm. We tend to look at the destination of the storm. And, and here the disciples were, was, was said, um, Jesus told the disciples to get on the boat to get to the other side, sorry, of Sea of Galilee, of Sea of Galilee. So, in, in the storm, if I, if I was here, if I was going through the storm, what I would tend to look at is I would look at the other side and I'm like, I cannot wait to reach the other side and get past this storm. 
In the storm, that's where we're looking. Oftentimes, we look at the other side. But can I talk to those people today who's going through a storm right now and just can't wait for it to be over? Is that you right now? You're, you're going through some sort of season in your life and you're like, God, I cannot wait for this season to be over. I cannot wait to get, just get to the other side. Just get to the destination. I want to encourage you right now and I want you, I want you to know that don't fixate on the other side too much, but instead focus on the will of God that he's doing in you right now. Church, Jesus did not promise an easy life. Jesus did not say, follow me and believe in me and I will remove the storms. I will keep you away from the storms. No, Jesus said in John 16 verse 33 that in this life you will have trouble, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Church, it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that you're in the will of God. That because you're in the will of God, you're gonna it's gonna be smooth sailing from there. It's gonna be smooth sailing from there. Just like these disciples, they were in the will of God, but the storm still came. It's not because it's not because you're in the will of God doesn't mean that everything's gonna be easy. Oh, I'm in New Zealand now. I'm in New Zealand, and because I'm in New Zealand, I'm in the will of God. So that means that everything's going to be easy. I'm just going to get a pay rise every year. I'm, I'm going to be able to pay my bills every, so easily. I'm a, my, my kids will grow up, will grow up, and we will have such a lovely family and a lovely household in New Zealand because we're in the will of God. But church, that's not the case. In this life, you will have trials. Just like these disciples. And how do I know that these disciples were in, the, were in the will of God? Why did the disciples get in the boat in the first place? Why did they try and cross the sea? Did, did they get in voluntarily? No, in verse 22 it says, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. How do I know that the disciples were in the will of God? It's because it was Jesus that sent them. It was Jesus that got them into the boat. And it was Jesus that sent them into the storm. You think Jesus didn't know that there was going to be a storm that night? Why did Jesus still make them get into the boat if he knew that they were going to go through storms? Do we ever ask that, ask that about ourselves? Do we ever ask, like, God, why? Why'd you put me here if you knew that I was going to have trouble? Why'd you put me in this situation if you knew that I was going to be in pain? Why would you put me in this job, Lord, if you knew that I was just going to be stressed, that it wasn't going to be a 9 to 5. This was going to be a 9 to 9. I'm going to take it home. I'm going to take it home with me. And I'm still thinking about work. Lord, why did you put me in this job if you knew that the people would not like me? Lord, why did why, you put me in this company if you knew that I was going to be redundant in a few years? Why did you bring me to New Zealand if you knew that I would have trouble getting my visa? That, I would, that it would be almost impossible to bring my family here. Why would you even bring me here in the first place, God? Why would you bring me to New Zealand if you knew that my children would have depression? That my children wouldn't, wouldn't grow up close to me? That they would be swayed by this world, by, this, by, by the culture of New Zealand? Why would you bring me here, Lord, if you knew that I was going to be struggling. Why am I here? Why would you give me a house, Lord, if you knew that the interest rates were going were gonna to go up and I wasn't going to be able to afford my, ha my, my home, my home loan? Why would you give me this thing if you knew that I couldn't handle it? I want you to know right now that I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to why God brought you here, the exact answer, but I do know one thing is that it's all part of God's will. Sometimes God's will is not to remove the storm, church. Sometimes God's will is not for you to go around the storm. It's not for you to be rescued or not rescued. It's not for you to avoid the storm. God's will, church, is sometimes through the storm. God's will sometimes is the storm. Whatever storm you're going through, he allowed it. He allowed it. Because he has a plan for you in that storm because his will is in that storm far too far too often we think that the will of God is the destination 
that the will of God, the, the only way, of, way for the will of God to prevail in my life is once I've reached the other side of the lake, once I've reached the other side of the sea. But no, church, the will of God is still prevailing in your life even though you're walking through the storm. Even though you're going through your storm right now, the will of God is still prevailing. The will of God is still happening. It's the will of God. It's not a destination. It's a journey. The will of God is a journey, church. And I want you to know right now that you are right in his will. Some people here need to hear that today. That you're going through a storm and maybe you're blaming yourself. And is this God's will in my life? Wherever you are right now. Whatever you're feeling around, I want to encourage you that you are right in his will. You know why? Because he is the one who sent you. And the one who sent you will carry you through the storm that you are in. Church, the same God that sent you here in New Zealand is the same God that can bring your family here. The same God that got you that job is the same God that will carry you through it. The same God that sent you to be a parent is the same God that gave you your children. And he's the same God that will bring them out of depression and anxiety. The same God that gave you the miracle of life is the same God that can give you the miracle of healing. The one who sent you into that storm will be the one to carry you through it, church. It's his will. It's his will. And if it's his will, then he's going to be there. Then he's going to be right there with you. If he sent you, he will equip you. If he sent you, he will bring you through it. Some of you are probably looking at this scripture and you're like, but where is God right now? Where is Jesus in this passage? Jesus sent the disciples to go on ahead of him into the storm. Where is Jesus right now? If we read verse 23. Jesus went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Where is Jesus he is praying and interceding for you, for the disciples. He is praying and interceding for you just because he feels far away. It doesn't mean that he's forgotten about you, church. It doesn't mean that he's no longer looking at you. We are in, where is Jesus right now? In Romans 8, 23, he's seated at the right hand of God interceding for us. If you feel like God's far away, don't even think for a second that he's forgotten about you every moment every second of your life he is interceding and praying for you much more than pastor june is praying for you much more than Tito Noel is praying for you 24 7 365 every millisecond nanosecond jesus is praying for you and thinking about you don't fear church for he is not only with you, but he is also interceding for you to the Father. It may seem like, it may, it may not seem like you are not, it may not seem like it, but you are in the will of God. And just because you are in a storm, it doesn't mean that it's not his will. The will of God comes with storms, like what I said earlier, church. And you may not understand it right now, but because you are in his will, he will give you the strength through the storm. Stop focusing on the other side. Stop focusing on the destination, but focus on the fact that I am still in the will of God. And if I am still in the will of God, the Holy Spirit is right beside me. Second point for today is to focus on the provider and not the provision. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him, they were scared and they said, it's a ghost, they said. They cried out in fear. When we face storms, we don't only tend to look at the destination or the other side. But one of the main things that we are looking at during the storm is the boat that we are in, right? There are people here today that are comparing the size of their boat to the size of their storm. If we keep reading verse 25, it says, shortly before dawn. Some scholars believe that this is between 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. In other translation, it says on the fourth watch. And on the fourth watch, it's usually the darkest part of the night, the darkest part, the darkest hour of the day. And we see here that on the darkest hour of the day, Jesus goes out to the disciples. Church, I want you to know right now that in your darkest hour, you may not see him. 
But he is coming to you. He is there. He is right beside you. Jesus went out to them shortly before dawn. If we keep reading in verse 25. Verse 25. I can picture the disciples in this moment. You know, they've been rowing their boat the whole night. From the nighttime and now it's morning. And, and, and it's, not, it's not like a, like a lake where there's no waves, you know. There's, it's just calm and, you know, it's, it's just you're just paddle boarding, and, you know, it's just summer. No, no. Here, remember, it's dark. It's stormy. There's waves. They've been paddling, trying to, trying to get across to the other side the whole night. That's what they've been trying to do. They get further and further from shore. They get further and further from shore, but the destination still feels so far away. You guys ever feel like that sometimes? Sometimes you feel like, I'm so far from where I used to, to be. But why is it that the destination still seems so far away? Still seems like I'm not even getting close to it. I'm so far from the shore, but I'm so far, but I'm still so far from the destination. It almost feels like I'm stuck right here in the middle. That no matter how hard I try to paddle, no matter how hard I try to, to, to paddle and move forward in advance, the wind and the wave just keeps pushing me back, pushing me back, pushing me back and pushing me here and keeping me right in the middle. Do you guys ever feel like that sometimes? You ever feel, any, anybody here feel like that? That you've been rowing your boat for so long and you feel like you're not getting anywhere. That you're just stuck in the middle. Every time you make progress, every time you feel like you're advancing, life hits you with a wave and it sets you back. That whenever you, it seems like there seems to be hope, that there seems to be light on the end of the tunnel, there's a wave and there's a wind that hits you back and keeps you in the middle. And the destination still feels so far away. But maybe the reason, church, why the disciples hasn't gotten anywhere even though they've been rowing all night. Sometimes we're, we say that to God, right? God, I'm doing my part though. I'm doing my part. I'm, I'm rowing. It's, it's, not, it's not like I'm letting the waves hit me. I'm doing my part, God. I, I'm, pray, I'm praying. Lord, I, I'm, I'm giving my tithes and offering. I'm coming to church. I'm coming to life group. I'm, I'm going to my work uh, early, early in the morning. I'm never late. Dude, I'm, I'm doing everything right, God. I'm, I keep rowing, but why am I still in the middle? Why can I not reach the destination yet? Maybe this is exactly what the disciples were feeling in that very moment. That they keep rowing and rowing. And maybe the reason why the disciples hasn't gotten anywhere is because God wanted to teach them in the lesson in the middle of the storm. In the middle of the lake. In the middle of the Sea of Galilee. God wanted to show them that it's not the boat that will get them across the sea. That will get them across the storm. I don't know if you've noticed church but there's somebody missing in this boat. In this boat, there's only 12 of them when there should be 13. I almost entitled this message as the 13th seat. The reason they aren't making any progress, church, is because Jesus isn't even in the boat yet. If Jesus isn't in your boat, the waves in the storm are just going to push you around, push you back where you started. Some people here have been rowing their boats by themselves for too long. And you're asking, Marco, why am I not making any progress? I've been trying to fix my marriage and my relationship for years, but I feel like we're not improving. I've been trying to fix my relationship with my children for so long and nothing is working. If only the disciples realized that they aren't going to get to the other side without the 13th man, then it would have been so much easier for them. Your marriage will not get better if it's only the two of you, church. You need to make room for the third person. Your family will not get better if Jesus is not in the center of your household. Progress happens, church, when Jesus is in the center. If you want to move, if you want to advance, you got to invite Jesus to come in your boat. You got to make room. You got to make room in that 13th seat. Some of you are saying, Jesus, my boat's too full. Can you just push me? Can you just let uh, command the waves to push me? And, and can you just take the storm away? But church, God, sometimes God will not let you go through the storm with just your boat. Because he wants you to know that it's not your boat that will get you across the sea. It is I. It is Jesus. It's not the boat, church. So let's focus on the provider and not the provision. There are often times in our life that we go through storms where we pray for a miracle. When we pray for provision, when we focus and we say, God, I wonder what your next provision is. But why don't we focus not on the provision today and focus on the provider? 
Because we always put our hope and trust on what he can provide. But we need to put our hope and trust on who can provide. It's not about what, it's not about how. Church, it's about who. Some of us are here today. We're putting our faith in and our trust in our boats to get us through the storm. And we, we look at the size of our storm and we see our boat and we, and we say, Lord, how is it going to make it through this? We look at the size of an up and coming expense and then we look at our bank accounts and we do the math. And the math's not mathing and we're like, what's happening here? We, we look at our economy and we look at our mortgages, our bills. We look at our finances and we compare the size of our finances to the size of the economy. It doesn't make sense. How is it going to work, God? How is it going to work? We compare the size of our storm to the size of our boat. That's why we are discouraged. If only I had a bigger boat. If only I had a bigger boat. If only I had a bigger bank account. If only I had a bigger salary. If only I had a bigger house, if only I had a bigger this, bigger this, if only I had more of this, more of that. But church, I need you to understand that in life, the storms may get bigger, but there are times where your boat will still stay the same. But does this mean that our God does not provide? Does this mean that he's not Jehovah Jireh? If the storms get bigger and bigger, but the boat remains the same, does that mean that he is a liar and he does not provide? God will provide the boat for your storm, but sometimes it will look small compared to your storm. Because God doesn't want, to put, doesn't want you to put your hope and trust on the boat. He wants you to put your hope and trust in him alone. Church, God wants some people here to understand again and again and again, I want to hammer this, that it's not your boat. It's not your bank account. It's not your skills. It's not your wisdom. It's not your boss. It's not the immigration officer. It's not the doctor. It's not the medicine. It's not, it's not any of these things that you can see. It's him. We tend to look for a way and not the way maker. We long for a miracle rather than the miracle worker. We sometimes fixate our eyes on the promise rather than the promise keeper. Is there anybody here today that have been focusing on what God can do rather than who God is? Don't focus on your boat. Those are just because the boat can just go away. The boat can just be destroyed. But focus on the provider, not the provision. Verse 27, take courage. Jesus says, don't be afraid. And what does he say next? Does he say, don't worry, I'll send you a new boat. I'll send you an even bigger boat to get you through the storm. Don't be afraid, I'll stop the storm. Don't be afraid, I'll calm the waves. Don't worry about it. No, what did he say? He says, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Take courage because I am. You're going through your storm and you're saying, God, this might not be big enough. But God says, yeah, but I am. I don't think my bank account's big enough for this, God. But he's saying, yeah, but I am. God, my boat might not be big enough for the storm. But he says, yeah, but I am. I am the great I am. Take heart life expressions, church. Your waves may not be bigger than your boat, but it's not bigger than your God. The storm may be bigger than your boat, but it's not bigger than the great I am. He is the one, he is the one, and he is who you need to be. He's exactly who you need to be in the storm that you're currently facing. Jesus said, it's not the boat, it is I. It is I. Take courage, life expressions, church. It is I. The reason why, maybe that's also the reason why in verse 29... Verse 29, Jesus made Peter move out of the boat, uh, get out of the boat because he wanted to step out of the boat. Because Jesus wanted to show Peter that you don't need the boat to go through the storm. All you need is me. That's why he said, come, come. It's not about the size of the provision. It's about the size of your provider, church. It's not about the size of the miracle. It's the size of the miracle worker. And I'm telling you, the, the size of the provision is nothing compared to the size of our God. All you need to do is focus on who's bigger. 
focus on Jesus. Look to Jesus in the middle of the storm. Jesus is teaching Peter that it's not the size of the boat. It's the size of your God. So keep your eyes on the one who is bigger than your storm. And that is Jesus Christ. That leads me to my third point. I'm breezing through this. But when the wind, but so now you can imagine Peter's walking on water, walking on water. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and he began to sink and he said, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Now we see Peter walking on water. Do something, th this man just did something uh, apart from Jesus, he did something that no man has ever done before or ever again. Have you guys ever thought about, thought about that? That Peter is the only man apart from Jesus that's ever walked on water. B.C., A.D., whenever, wherever it is, Peter's the only one. But then, but then in verse 30, he starts to see the wind. He starts to see the wave. Now logic starts to turn on for Peter. Before he was walking on water, and now he's thinking logically. He's thinking, hang on, hang on, th this doesn't make sense. I'm defying the laws of nature here. Scientifically, this shouldn't be possible. Shouldn't be possible. I shouldn't be walking on water. So, so he takes his eyes off Jesus, and he looks at the waves. See, the moment that he takes his eyes off the waves, he begins to sink. The more that we fixate on our problems, church, the less we are looking on Jesus. The more aware we are of the storm, the less aware we are of Jesus. We make the storms, actually the storms in our life ain't even that big compared to Jesus. We, we just make the storms in our life bigger than what they really are. Because we fixate on it too much that when we fixate on it, we, we magnify them. The more we fixate on something, the more bigger it becomes and the more impact it has in our lives. And when we begin to fixate on it, when we begin to magnify it, what tends to happen is that it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you get overwhelmed and then you begin to sink and then now it's being, and you're being consumed by the storm. Sometimes we're looking at our storms, church, and we keep thinking about it day and night, day and night. And we can't sleep at night and it just becomes bigger and bigger than it really is. It's not even that big compared to our God. But sometimes we can't even see God anymore because we fixate so much on the problem. But we need to focus our eyes on Jesus and not the storm. Here Peter begins to fixate on his circumstances. He begins to look at his situation. Much like Peter, we, we go through storms. We look at our condition. We look at, rather than we look at Jesus. We look at our symptoms. We look at what the doctor says. We look at our finances. We look at the bad news. We look at the bad news around the world. We look at all these things. But we're human. I can't blame you for looking at that. We get distracted so easily. You know, there's not a single person in this world that is just Jesus, 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 and then a storm comes, and they never, they never see the storm. You know, if, if, if they don't see the storm, sometimes, sometimes they call them delusional. The, the, the word calls them, you're delusional. How do you not see the storm? There's not a single person in this world that does not get distracted every now and then. We're human, we make mistakes, and there are plenty more times where he will take our eyes off, where we will take our eyes off Jesus, but we need to understand, church, that it's a choice. That you can't say, oh, the enemy, the enemy, the enemy is tempting me. The enemy, the, the reason why I keep looking is because the enemy is blocking, the enemy is not blocking anything. It's a choice, church. You are the one who's taking your eyes off Jesus. Jesus is not the one taking his eyes off you. If you focus on your problem, but we can choose to return our gaze and fix our eyes back to Jesus just like in the scripture. And he will lift us up back above our storm once again. If you focus on your problem and you try to fix yourself, it's kind of like you trying to swim your way out of the storm. I don't care how good of a swimmer you are. I don't care if you've been taking swimming lessons. You won't make it. I don't know about you, but I'd rather walk above my storm then swim in it without him. But maybe you are here today and you've been focusing on, uh, focusing on a storm recently and you're overwhelmed by it, you're consumed by it, and you're drowning to the point that you can't even see Jesus even no matter how hard you try. 
There are some people here today that the storms have gotten bigger, bigger, bigger in, in their vision that they can't even see. I think you're in the same situation that Peter is in. Peter is here. Peter is here. You're saying how? See, I'm imagining, I'm imagining that Peter is sinking here, that he's submerged in water, almost drowning in the storm. That even if he tried to get his head above water, there's another large wave coming at him, crashing on his face, making it hard for him to see what's in front of him, let alone even opening his eyes. And the way I picture it is that Peter is engulfed and consumed by the waves, that he literally couldn't even see Jesus. Keep in mind that this, this was at 3 a.m. as well. Pitch black in the middle of the sea. It's not like here today where there's street lights, where there's, you know, all these things. This is pitch black in the middle of the night. Have you, have you guys ever seen those, um, those TikToks or those, those videos on YouTube of what the middle of the sea, the middle of the ocean looks like at night? It's pitch black. This is what it looks like here. G Peter couldn't even see Jesus even if he wanted to. There will be times where we experience this, where we can't see Jesus in our situation. We can't see him in our problems. We can't see him in our sickness. We can't see him in our depression. We can't see him in our anxiety, our brokenness, our loneliness, in our darkest hours. But what did Peter do when he could not see Jesus? He didn't use his eyes. He used his mouth. And he said, he cried out. He said, Jesus, Lord Save me. Are you not seeing Jesus today? Is the storm in your life bigger than what you, what, the, the, bigger than you think? Is it blocking Jesus from you? Are you not seeing Jesus right now? If you don't see him, cry out to him because he's there. There are some people that here that need to realize this today. That just because you took your eyes off Jesus, it doesn't mean that Jesus has taken his eyes off you. He just needs you to call out to him. Call out to the name of Jehovah. To call out to the name of Jesus. It's not about your eyes anymore. The faith, the faith he used. It's not, faith is not just about you seeing. You see, it's easy to see Jesus when you're walking on your miracle. It's easy to see Jesus when you're walking on above water. But the moment you get submerged, the moment that you can't see Jesus anymore, can you use your mouth? Can you use your voice and cry out to him in the middle of the night? Lord, God, save me. I don't know if you're there. I cannot see that you're there. But I know that your hand is right there. And it says, Lord, save me. He cried out. What happened? Jesus let him drown for a little while. He said, Jangkalang muna. You need, to, you need to learn for having no faith. You need to learn for being distracted. No. He said, immediately, Jesus reaches out his hand and caught him. Church, Jesus is reaching out his hand to you right now. Will you call upon the name of God? Will you call upon the name of Jesus right now in your situ situation, in your circumstances, in your storm? Will you call upon the name of Jesus? Focusing not with your eyes, not just with your eyes, but also with your prayer, with your voice, with your mind and your heart. How do we fix our eyes on the unseen? Cry out to him. Call upon the name of Jesus and you will be saved. And he will reach out his hand and carry you through your storm. It's not just the storms in our life, church, that keep our eyes off Jesus. I want to touch quickly on this. But it's also the sins in our life. In Hebrews 12, it says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that easily so entangles us. And let us run with perseverance in the race, perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Church, what are the things right now that are weighing you down? What are the things right now? It's not just the storms that are keeping, you, keeping your eyes off Jesus. There's also the sins in our lives. There's also things in our lives, weights in our lives that are weighing us down and, and making us sink rather than walking on our miracle. Church, we need to identify those things that we need to throw off. Throw off the things that easily entangle us. Throw off the things that hinder you from seeing God in, the, in this very moment. Throw off those things and let us run with perseverance. Run above the water by looking at Jesus. 
We fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. We skip so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Can I get Jay-Z up here, please? I firmly believe, church, that even though Peter took his eyes off Jesus, Jesus never took his eyes off Peter. Even if we take our eyes off Jesus, he's always looking at us. He's always with us. Just because you can't see him, it doesn't mean he's not there. 2,000 years ago, when he was nailed on that cross, a few minutes before his last breath, imagine that scene. Imagine if you could get a time machine and go back to that very moment of where Jesus was. Hanging on that cross, taking his last few breaths. And you see Jesus looking far off into the distance, taking his last few breaths. And if you ask him the title of this message, you say, God, where are you looking? Jesus, where are you looking right now? What are you thinking of right now? And you know what I think he would say? He would say, I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you. He's looking at you. The very last breath that he had, Jesus Christ was looking. He knew that you'd disobey him. He knew that oftentimes, why am I? He knew that oftentimes you would put him last. He knew that he would, he would reject him. He knew that you would sometimes forget about him. He knew that you would often mess up and hurt him. But he couldn't help it because he was looking. past your he looked past your sin he looked past your shortcomings he looked past your lies he looked past the times that you rejected him he looked past all that because he could not bear to see heaven without you where is Jesus looking in this very moment he is looking That's the grace, church. That's something that we do not even deserve. That the very God that doesn't even owe us anything still managed to look at you in his very last breath. That's the Jesus that we serve, church. If he was looking at you in his very last breath, just, a, just like just when he's about to die, what makes you think that he's not looking at you right now, seated at the right hand of the Father? If he conquered death already, what makes you think that he cannot, that he's not looking at you right now? You may feel like nobody's looking at you. Nobody can see your struggles. Nobody can see your, that you're in pain. Nobody can see the storms that you're going through. But Jesus is looking at you. Jesus is looking at your heart. Jesus knows exactly what you need right now. He is looking at you, church. It's not the provision, not the destination. It's not the storm, but it is Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, church, there are storms. There are, storm, there are people right now that are going through storms right now. But I want you to know if there's anything that you can take home from this message is that Jesus is looking at you. Jesus is looking at you, church. And I know that there are storms in this place for every single one of us. Are, you know, it may be big for others. It may be small for others. But every single one of you, Jesus knows what the storm you're going through. So I want to take this moment where we, I want to take this moment right now where we get, to, we get to throw off the things that entangle us. We get to throw off the things that hinder us from seeing Jesus. This is the moment right now that you say, God, I don't want, I, I, if you don't want to remove the storm, don't remove it. But help me see you through the storm. This is the time where we get to cry out in the name of Jehovah right now. 
that we're going through a storm that we don't understand. The Lord, I'm not looking forward for the destiny. I may, sure you can look forward, Lord, but I'm not going to focus on the destination anymore. I'm going to focus on your will that you have in my life right now.